We are back. Another Friday. Yay. Hey, welcome everybody to the show. It is October 6th, 2023. And back by popular demand, we have Dr. Lori Marbus. She's going to be doing a wonderful Q&A session with us. So get out your get out your questions and uh, and throw them into the chat room. But before you do that, let us know where you are listening from today and what the temperature is where you are. Today in Austin, I want you all to know that it is right now 84 degrees, Lori, and we have not seen a day below 90 in a long, long time. So this is very monumental for us. Wow. It's 84 here in Mission Viejo, California, and it's very unusual to be this hot. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. Well, we got Beth tuning in from Tulsa, and it's 67 in Tulsa right now. Yeah. How about that? Um, so <clears throat> did you say you're in Mission Viejo right now? Yeah, California. That's where I live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Mission Viejo is notorious for being a huge swimming power. Like they've had the oh, mission. yeah. Literally yeah. down the street. There's the pools and everything. It's amazing facilities. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, they've, they have they have they have produced more Olympians from that that club team, the Mission Viejo Natadors, than yep. wow, than just about anybody. That's impressive. Yep. Very, yep, very cool. It is. Yep. It's pretty um, cool. So do you have any Halloween decorations where you're living right now? Have they gone up yet? Yes. Oh yeah, they're already they were up uh, I think right as midnight struck October 1st and our neighbor likes to play the ones that are loud and make creepy sounds. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, our neighborhood is going up like crazy right now. So we got goblins and spooks and werewolves everywhere you turn. It is, uh, it is the season of spookiness. All right. So wow, everybody, everybody, we've got limited time here with Dr. Lori. So I'd love to, utilize her as much as we can uh, with your burning questions that you have. I'll get the the kind of the ball rolling here, Lori, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. So I've seen a lot of noise lately about what some reason it's bad to combine bananas with berries. Uh, and I'm wondering if you've seen this, heard of it, and if there's any kind of validity to, uh, you know, why it would be wrong to combine a banana with some berries. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I first heard this from a patient, I don't know, about a month or so ago. I guess there was a small study indicating that there's an enzyme from bananas, PPO or something that will keep berries from, you know, you can't absorb the nutrients as well from the berries. So it's best to separate them. Again, it was a really small study. It kind of glanced it over, and I wasn't impressed enough to remove my banana from <laughs> my very connect concoction because it makes me quite happy to eat those two things together. Um, so, but there is maybe I would say a signal that there might be something to consider. I don't necessarily think you have to make huge changes, but at the moment, it's kind of like yeah, let's see what the evidence shows. But I I wasn't convinced it was a very small study. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, I usually have two bananas on my <laughs> cereal with berries, with kiwi. Anybody that's been following me on Instagram knows that I use, I have at least three different fruits on my cereal and sometimes four or five with different nuts yep. and seeds. And yep. um, I, 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 I find it absolutely, it's, it, to me, it almost sounds like, you know, well, there's, there's lignins or there's lectins in those beans and oh boy, that's a bad thing. And right. uh, you know, right. the reality is something yeah. else. Yeah, absolutely. And I've literally have had bananas and berries almost every single day for the last 12 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't you, know. You, I'm doing pretty good. So there's that. <laughs> yeah. You look like you're holding up. All right. For sure. I'm for holding sure. Up pretty good. And you too. All right. <laughs> all right. I'm going to go in and start pulling up some of these questions here. So this is from We Celebrate Eating Plants. Wants to know, should we wait to shower after sunshine for optimal vitamin D? Do you understand exactly uh, what that question yeah. is, what they mean? Yeah. So well, there okay. was some like concern like the, the 
you're in the sunshine and the vitamin D is being changed, right, um, in your skin. And should you wait? Could you wash it off? I haven't seen any evidence that you need to do that. I personally, out in the sun, will shower because I, you know, you're sweating. <laughs> gross. So, yeah. um, it, you know, it, it's completely up to you and your hygienic preferences. I don't think you need to worry so much. The majority of the people that I've seen anyway um, may require small amounts of vitamin D supplementation just to keep it above, even if they live in Florida. And if you're living in Florida and outside, I'm not sure people want to be around you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it really is, I think, um, again, it gets to that. It's such a minute concern. People get really deep in the weeds. And I'm just like, and ignoring kind of the bigger things in lifestyle that they should be complementing with, you know, being out in the sun, like good sleep, eating whole food plant-based diet. We get zeroed in on one small thing. But no, I I don't think you need to do so much worry. But again, I haven't dove into the research um, okay. on that particular topic, but I will make a note of it. Um vitamin D and yeah. showering. I mean it's a um it's an interesting it's an interesting question and yeah. uh and something that may deserve a little more attention. Um, absolutely. Is there anything that can help with COPD? Yeah, absolutely. So when you think about COPD, so <clears throat> this is an issue typically reserved for those who have a history of smoking or current smokers. They may require oxygen. But when you switch to a whole food plant-based diet, I've seen some really interesting things happen with COPD, including like their pulmonary functions. Like there's pulmonary function tests you can do. You know, how much can a person breathe in? How rapidly can they breathe out? Their lung capacity. The inflammation decreases, which is dramatic in mm -hmm. a whole food plant-based diet, which will help alleviate, you know, the need for medications and your breathing capacity you may see improve along with the fact that you can also do more exercise, which will also help with all of that. So all of it comes together, but I think it honestly starts one stopping what may have caused it, which would be the smoking. And then two, uh, doing your best to eat a healthy whole food plant based diet for sure. Sounds, sounds, sounds like a good protocol right there. Um, mm -hmm. This is from Ellen wants to know, can you talk about vital wheat gluten? It seems like an item that's too processed to be healthy. Yeah, you... I guess. I mean, I certainly wouldn't go out looking for, you know, like, and it really depends if what you're making and what you're doing. Um, I don't know much as far as like, is it too processed to be healthy? I think anything you have to look at in the whole. So I would, again, let's move to the whole food versus removing something because if we start isolating, for example, a whole soybean is fantastic, but we start bringing out the soy protein isolate, that's an issue, right? So then it starts acting more like animal protein. It can cause more issues. So um, where are you talking this in the context? Is this in a processed food? Are you adding it to a recipe to do a certain function? So I guess it really depends on the context and how much you're taking yeah. in. Um, yeah. yeah. I would imagine like when I think of vital wheat gluten, I think of usually like seitan. Right, mm -hmm. which is a which right. is a great kind of you know meat substitute. It's what seventy percent protein. Yes, it's yep. it's, pro it's processed. Um, yep. But I think if you're going to have that, like like we probably have it once every two weeks in a stir fry. Yeah, uh, I exactly. think it, it can be. Yeah, I think it be. I think it can be fine. You're not overdoing it, and um, yeah. Yeah. The only thing you need to be concerned about is if you, you know, have celiac disease or some gluten sensitivity right. issues. Um, some individuals, I'd say 10 to 15 percent of those with Hashimoto's or hypothyroid issues um, may want to be very careful about their gluten uh, intake as well. So but again, it's not all people who have Hashimoto's a smaller percentage. So, yeah. 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 Um, I'm just kind of pulling them up here as they're as they're coming in. Would love to ask how to get more protein collagen in my diet, especially after my recent surgery. Do um, uh, you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah. So, you know, it's it's an interesting discussion because after surgery, you do need more protein in order to heal, right? Because those your body is reconstructing all the things that were damaged in that process. And so, again, it can, gets back to really focusing in on tofu and beans and whole grains and eating those foods that have higher percentage of protein, um, nuts and seeds as well, right? So it's again, another source of great protein, healthy fats, but the collagen, your body will take the precursors that you're consuming, vitamin C and some other things and make the collagen. Um, so I would be less concerned about consuming some type of collagen 
mm. supplement, which a lot of people will recommend because it's broken down in the digestive system anyway. But again, making sure you're eating adequate calories to sustain a healthy weight. And if you want to focus in on some higher protein foods, I don't think that's a bad idea. It's, it seems like collagen is like trending in, in a major way oh, yeah. right now. Oh, like they're, sure. put, they're, they're putting it in food. People are taking it in supplemental form. And is yeah. there any, is there anything to that? Not that I've seen. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of the quote unquote, so if you're strictly plant-based or vegan, you're already, what you're getting in these vegan collagen supplements are the precursors, right? So again, what you can get from whole foods. So save your money off these very extensive supplements that are probably not going to be showing any benefit, but you know, people worry about wrinkles and different things, skin integrity with the collagen components. Um, so not that I've seen any evidence to it. Got it. Um, this is just a nice comment from Lori Williams saying, and this is in reference to you and I both have bananas with berries, right? <laughs> and how we, you know, I, I've been doing it for a good, you know, you said 12 years, I've been doing it almost 35 years and we both look great. So thank you, Lori. <laughs> thank you, Lori. I like your name too. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, this is from Penny, uh, mm -hmm. Drugsma. What a great last name. Penny Drugsma. Dr. Yeah. Marbus, what are your thoughts on using plant sterile capsules to help lower cholesterol? Yeah, it's really interesting. So um, the plant sterols, you know, when I first discovered them a few years ago, especially with patients who are really struggling to get their cholesterol down, I thought it would might be a good idea. But if you dig into the research, and this is more animal-based research, by the way, um, what we found is that the, you know, the plant sterols keep your body from reabsorbing your body's cholesterol that's being recycled, right? So it basically inhibits that absorption. So you will see a decrease in numbers. However, the sterols, the plant sterols and the cholesterol are very similar in, think of it as a shape, right? So you're taking uh, a key and fitting it into a lock or a receptor, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, some molecules fitting into its receptor. So what's happening here is that people take up the plant sterols instead and they can actually incorporate, incorporate it into like atherosclerotic plaque. So it can actually, you can still have an acceleration of atherosclerotic plaque, even though your numbers are lower. So you might be a little bit deceived in that sense. So I personally do not recommend them um, just based on the current evidence that we have. And there's probably some genetic propensity to who can do that and who can't. But if you want to consume foods that are high in plant sterols, I think that's a safe way to go, like sunflower seeds or sesame seeds, something like that would be fine. Wonderful information. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go a little bit farther down and then I'm going to start coming back up on the, uh, the list with questions. So Nikki wants to know, can you address hair loss during a transition period to whole food plant-based? I'm guessing there might be a, might be some minor hormonal shuffling going on. Yeah. So I've seen this a few different times. Um, and I definitely would like to address it because I think hair loss, especially, um, for women can be quite disconcerting. <laughs> so when you transition or have any type of stress, be it good stress, you will sometimes see when you're having a lower calorie diet, that might be part of it. Um, for example, I had, when I first started implementing a whole food plant-based diet with patients, I neglected to say, eat all four categories. I said, just go eat plants. And they went straight to the produce aisle and left out the beans, <laughs> the whole uh -huh. grains. But these were things that I had to learn you know, 12 years ago when transitioning and practicing, because they didn't really have good places for you to go learn. Um, so there's that piece, right? And sometimes this will happen, you know, your, your, your hair goes through these phases of growth. And majority of the time you have about 80 to 90% of your hair is in active growth phase, and then the others in a dormant phase. And when you have this transition or stress in the body, you may see, you know, down to 40% growth phase and 60% dormant. And then they, there's a hair loss. And what you'll see is over three to six months, that hair growth should return. It's kind of like after pregnancy, you'll get a rapid amount of luscious mean hair. And then you, ha you have the baby and it all falls out. So maybe it's the stress of the re releasing the, the baby, but or maybe just the parenthood. But the other thing that should be very mindful of is our iron stores. So if your ferritin is less than 50, so if ferritin is the protein that holds onto iron and stores it away. Um, if it's less than 50, there's been really good evidence of making one, you can, you can increase your iron rich foods, but sometimes women are low. And I speak to women because most of my patients in the ones I see this happen with, um, or if you're a runner, long distance runner, sometimes you'll see a lower iron scores. 
Um, but if your ferritin is less than 50, and if we can, you know, if they're having heavy periods or something else, or maybe they're in a not eating well or whatever the multitude of reasons might be, if we actually do some supplementation for a period of time, get that ferritin over 50, the hair loss in 100% of cases will typically stop. Um, and that's also goes with, and these are people who are not anemic. So you could also have that occur with people with restless leg. Um, typically you want to get ferritin around 75 or above and then fatigue for women who have this, just like, I'm just fatigued, but everything looks normal. Your thyroid's normal. You're not anemic, but your ferritin's below 50. Sometimes that will improve. So just some things to think about with hair loss. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, this is from, wait, let me. Somehow I lost that one. Here we go. Um, yeah, from Nan. What are your recommendations for someone with osteoporosis? I hear negative things about medications like Fosomax. Can I get enough calcium through my diet and build bones with a daily walk of at least two miles? So osteoporosis is a complicated matter. First of all, we should be having this discussion with parents and their children because we really need to be banking on our bone stores, you know, in childhood, because by age 30, that's when we start actually losing our bone mass. But absolutely, resistance training is key, right? At least three times a week, you know, doing lifting, moving heavy things. Walking can be a part of that, but I would still push towards more resistance training, like compound movements, progressive strength training, uh, progressive overload, um, where you're, you know, lifting and pushing and pulling and doing different things. Kind of like go watch Ann Esselstyn for a day. That's what <laughs> I have to say. There. Right. So those are the type of things you need to do. Now, as far as osteoporosis prevention, that's a big thing. Make sure your vitamin D's are above 30, making sure you are getting enough calcium, which you most honestly can, right? If you would go to something like my fitness pal or chronometer and you track your food, you know, if you're hitting like a thousand milligrams per day, um, you're fine. Now, some people may have had a history of uh, fractures, right? So if they have very fragile bones and, you know, they've had spinal collapse or they've had a hip fracture or some fall with some other type of um, fracture, they may require medication. And unfortunately, that's just where we're at. Now, those individuals will probably require calcium supplementation just because remember the body's inhibiting the release of calcium for things like muscle contraction and things. So you would need that. Now, outside of being on medications that inhibit the calcium being released, I do not recommend calcium supplementation because calcium supplementation <clears throat> can increase atherosclerotic plaque. It can cause, um, you know, the, what they think is happening is, is the calcium enters into the bloodstream. It can cause some platelet aggregation or some clotting to occur. So those are the things you need to be mindful of, but making sure your vitamin D, getting out in the sun, doing strength training, walking again, and you should be able to get enough protein and calcium and all the good things that you need to uh, have healthy bones. But if you have yeah. osteoporosis and it's severe, this is, that's a different discussion. And you need to know why, why do you have osteoporosis? Right? So there, there's lots of different reasons. Yeah. And I would tell you too, you know, don't smoke, don't know, you don't want to, uh, too much salt is bad as well. Right. And, um, right. yeah, you could have hyperthyroidism, you could have, uh, parathyroid issues. I mean, there's so many issues that need to be investigated. Um, but yeah, just, uh, you need to know why so you can correct course. All right. Here's an interesting question from Meg. She's lost 50 pounds. She's off blood pressure meds. I think, <laughs> uh, I think her question is she's having one cup of black coffee. Uh, it looks like a day. Her blood pressure is 125 over 77. Is green tea. Okay. I'm whole food plant-based, no oil, no alcohol. Uh, I run or walk 10 K a day. I have 30 pounds left to lose. Curious about your opinion. Yeah. And I, I think one cup of coffee is fine per day and green tea. If you enjoy that, um, what's going to happen, you know, obviously the 125 over 77 is better, but it's not optimal, right? We want to see it less than 120, even probably closer to like 115 on top, um, and definitely under 80 on the bottom, but congratulations, by the way, for losing 50 pounds. That is absolutely phenomenal. But as you lose that additional weight, you should see your blood pressure start to decline. And then it would just include foods that also help with blood pressure, right? Potassium rich foods. You want to, you could try hibiscus tea, ground flaxseed, all those things, dark green leafy vegetables, 
all those incredible foods that you can add into your diet will also help get that number a little bit lower. But if you want a cup of coffee, again, I think it's okay. There's actually some interesting things, health benefits to coffee. I don't drink coffee. I just never like the taste. But um, for those who do, I don't. Yeah, I'm the same way. I've never, I've never been a drinker of coffee. Yeah, no, I do Um, drink tea, my black tea (laughs) on a regular basis. Yeah, good. Uh, Speaking of which, you know, we have some of the best teas on the planet. I'll have to send you some. Oh, please. Oh, I'm telling people all about you, you, (laughs) your food all the time. So you're definitely on my list of uh, things to do. All right. Uh, uh, Sharon wants to know, look at how you spell Sharon. Isn't that wild? S-H-A-R-Y-N. Cool. Uh, best to take B12 with or without food. I don't think it really matters. Yeah. 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 Well, that's what I was thinking. Kelly wants to know, does intermittent fasting with plant-based eating help to lose weight? Sure. Yeah. So let's think about what intermittent fasting is doing. One, it's making you mindful of your food and how much you're intaking. So most of the time it's because people are eating less food, right? You're skipping a meal, Um, or you're condensing your food and you're not as hungry and you've set these rules of like, I'm not going to snack later in the evening when I'm watching television. So yeah, it it ends up being most of the time related to a caloric deficit, which is why you would lose weight. But if you put someone on a whole food plant-based diet and do intermittent fasting, yeah, absolutely. It's a very powerful combination. Mm -hmm. Connie, do all sugars affect the body the same way? Maple syrup, white sugar, date sugar, coconut sugar, date syrup, and the fakes, mm. stevia and erythritol. Yeah, so it's it, that's an interesting yeah. question. Um, now, have I gone down to the rabbit holes of the sugar, you know, where it's coming from? These are still simple sugars. Um, I think there's probably healthier in the sense of where they're coming from, right? Maybe they're less processed, but sugar is still sugar at the end of the day, and you'll see blood sugars rise. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I would still just be very mindful of your sugar intake, regardless of where it's coming from. I still use maple syrup. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't, and sometimes date syrup, but again, these are just one-offs. It's not like I'm having this every single day. It's in a recipe. Um, and I think maple syrup is, you know, there's probably some compounds that have health benefits to them. Like, um, honey is not vegan, but honey Mm -hmm. in general has some really interesting antiviral antibacterial properties. Um, when I was taking my wilderness medicine, uh, courses, um, they talked about having honey sticks available beyond the fact for diabetics who might need it, but application to wounds. So it's really fascinating in that sense. For sure. Um, yeah, if I could add to that, you know, typically almost all of these are 50 calories in a tablespoon. Um, (laughs) Hey, what's up there? Good doggy. Uh, for the most, for the, for the most part, you know, they all are empty calories, but I will say like, you know, the, the good thing I would say about date sugar, for example, is it's basically just pulverized dates. And so you're at least getting, you know, all the fiber and, and some nutrition as well there. Um, yeah. I think it's, if it's taking the whole fruit and putting yeah. a little water and blending it, that's fine. That's a different story yeah. than pulling yeah. the sugar, you know, molecules out of it for sure. Yeah. But, 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 but Connie, the thing is, you know, most Americans are are consuming 30 added teaspoons of sugar uh, a day. That's 150 plus pounds a year. And that's an and that's an issue. So right. I think to, I think what Lori and I, it's like we really, you know, if you can keep your added sugars to like two, two added teaspoons a day, I don't think it really matters what I, I wouldn't do the, the fake stuff. But right. it, it really shouldn't make a difference. It's just America is overdosing. And the fact of the matter is we've got it in your pasta sauce, your yogurt. You've got it in your crackers. I mean, you, you can't escape it. So you got to learn to read labels and, and buy, buy packaged, boxed, and canned foods intelligently. Yeah. Pasta <laughs> sauces, ketchup, places you wouldn't know. Think about it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, here's a biggie. Oh, okay. I had a sudden, a sudden cardiac arrest on October 8th, 2017. I have a defibrillator and have never had one problem until August 7th. I woke up and my legs hurt so bad that I could barely walk. I easily walk seven miles a day without pain. Only when I first wake up, my doctor said I need to stop my BPD. I'm not sure what that is and go I dash. Oh, oh, I know what that. Yeah. And go dash because it was my diet that caused the pain. 
I've been plant-based since uh, for 18 months. I don't know. What do you think? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Plant-based diet is not going to suddenly cause your legs to hurt and barely walk. I would think uh, back injury, um, either that or some arterial like issues there with some type of clotting issue, right? Because you have a history of atherosclerosis. Maybe there's, you know, remember, it doesn't just affect the heart arteries. It could affect the arteries going down into the legs. So um, I would absolutely please uh, seek a, a secondary opinion um, because that is absolutely not true. Um, you need additional workup and if anything, imaging blood tests and things like that. So please do not ignore that. Okay. Thank you. Um, no. Rhonda, best way to get rid of visceral fat. And, and will you, will you help tell people what yeah. is visceral fat? Yeah. So visceral fat is the fat that's going to kill you. <laughs> so think, of the, think of it, you know, it's different than the fat on someone's hips, right? So this is, these are the individuals that you may see that have more of an apple shape. And what visceral fat means it's the fat in and around, our, uh, around, around your organs, right? If you think inside your gut and different things. So this is very inflammatory fat stores. And so the best way to reduce um, your visceral fat is again, eating a whole food plant-based diet, having a, you know, moderate caloric deficit exercise and doing all the things that we always tell you to do things that we know we should do, but we don't always do as well. But as you lose weight, the visceral fat should begin to dissipate as well. And there's different um, testing you can do like an in-body scan will tell you to some degree, I don't know how much of accuracy, or you could do like a DEXA scan specifically for body composition. And that can mm -hmm. kind of give you an idea of your visceral fat as well. All right. Um, Justin here wants to know with the weather starting to change, what foods are you looking forward to this fall? Oh, uh, soups. Uh, <laughs> what'd you soups say? Soups and chili. Soups and chilies. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Like uh, two nights ago, we made a, I should say my wife made it. It was a <laughs> pumpkin chickpea curry dish that we'd made over, Ooh. over rice, brown rice. And it was divine, oh. but definitely, definitely stews, chilies, wonderful hearty soups. Um, mm -hmm. I love dipping a nice, a nice uh, bread in those things or rolls. Mm -hmm. Uh, the plan strong cornbread that's out. Oh my gosh. There. I love your cornbread. <laughs> I love your yeah. cornbread. It's, it's, good. I, it's good. Yeah. 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 I, I, actually, I had somebody yesterday that told me they took, um, they took, I think it was two of the chunky chipotle uh, chilies, poured it into a, a saucepan or not a saucepan, a dish. So, uh, yeah, a dish. And then they did a, a package of the cornbread on top of that and they had chili cornbread. Oh. Oh, really? nice. Oh, that's a great idea. Because I have actually, a chili in my it, cabinet as well. It was Carrie, actually, who was ah. hiding, lurking in the shadows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, all right. What's this? Um, what is your take on supplementing DHA EPA? I've seen a lot of back and forth on this from the plant-based doctors. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? I am... Uh, you know, Are I debate in my head. Yeah, I'm actually very torn. So because when you do like an omega check or fatty acid check to levels, you know, many times you'll see someone if they're not supplementing with like the omega threes, the long chain algae uh, or algal oil, um, you'll see that they're low. But then there's evidence that maybe this is, you know, the DHA is actually stored in tissue. So you can't accurately measure yeah. it. Of course, we're not going to go do some brain tissue biopsy. And I've met some amazing people who, and they point out the research and I'm like, well, there's that too. But, <laughs> you know, if someone's not eating a lot of nuts and seeds, maybe they're not getting much ALA, mm. you know, I, I feel torn. So I think um, what I'd like to do is look at the person, talk to them if they're having any history of heart disease or if they have inflammatory disease, like some type of rheumatoid arthritis or autoimmune disease, I give them a small amount. I think it's 250 milligrams per day is one to maybe just, you know, I, I just like to maybe just get our levels okay until we have a little bit more evidence and a little bit better testing available because um, it's really important for brain health, heart health. And I, I just would be concerned if we just base our decision on what we know right now on completely not some well, that, supplementing. I don't yeah. know. Well, and let me ask you this. Um, 
it seems like a, a, a smart idea as an insurance policy, but yeah. you, in your opinion or in any research or any data, has it shown that having excessive amounts can do damage and what kind of damage does it do? Like what are the right. side effects? How is it harmful? Right. Yeah. So if you isolate, like for example, EPA, right. And there's prescription medications, you can increase your risk for bleeding and different things like that. So you do need to be careful and 250 milligrams of a EPA DHA is not going to be harmful for you um, in that sense. But uh, yeah, you can absolutely anything. It's even water, right. It's, it's dose dependence, right. The, the poison is in the dose. So you drink a gallon of water in five minutes, you may have hyponatremia and die. So, yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, all right. Well, the jury's still out on the old DHA EPA, but. Uh, I, I will tell you, I take a small amount every day if that will help. Alleviate what do you take? What do you, how much do you take? I have around 250 milligrams, 350 milligrams, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And is it a, is it a. Is it a DHA EPA capsule that you take or how, what form do you take it in? It's a capsule. Um, okay. It's a, yeah. The, yeah. And people are funny too, because they get so concerned about the fat and the oil. They're like, vitamin D is coming in an oil capsule. That's too much oil. <laughs> okay. No, it's, you'll be all it's right. It's a fat soluble vitamin. <laughs> it's all right. And the, the yeah. same thing for the omegas. <laughs> so we've had, uh, this is our second question. So I'll, I'll bring it to you here on uh, tinnitus, you know, oh, do, you, do you have any tinnitus. thoughts on what can help with tinnitus? Ah, oh, that's a tough and, one, and for, right? and for people, And for people that don't know, tinnitus is that ringing, that obnoxious ringing in the ears. And I can tell you when I was a firefighter, Lori, mm -hmm. and especially after some loud calls or, and actually when I was young, after some loud rock concerts, yeah. you just have that ringing in the ears that would last for a long time. Um, yeah. So, and, it's, and it's really like, obnoxious. Yeah. So the tinnitus, I haven't seen too much in the sense of treatment that's been very successful. Honestly, it's a matter of learning to live with it and making it part of it. So you just kind of get used to it. You don't hear it as much. Maybe most people deal with it at night, like dealing with, they'll put like a white noise machine in or something that they kind of hides the sound. Um, Cause when I was in the military, there were, you know, I was in the air force, so there's lots of people exposed to loud noises all the time. And it's the number one, I would say one of the most common disability ratings that we get of folks who are leaving the military is tinnitus. And it can be quite significant and loud and just annoying. Um, but I don't have any good evidence as to what can help with it um, dietary wise or otherwise. And I'm so sorry. I wish I did. Yep. Yep. Well, thank you. Um, so again, we celebrate eating plants wants to know if we roast deeply like sweet potatoes, does that detract from the nutrition as opposed to just roasting lightly? I've never uh, heard that I don't before. know the difference, I guess, because yeah. I would just say roast it until it's done where you can poke a fork through it and it's tender. Yeah. So I don't know. I, you still need to cook it till it's cooked. So then I would stop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe slowly at a lower rate, maybe a lower Temperature might be something you might want to consider, but like, I don't know. What do you roast yours well, at? I'm sure. Well, I, I know that for example, there's um, when you do, when you brown toast and other things like that. Um, what's it called that you create? I'm, I'm trying to remember. The AGEs. Uh, there's another word I was looking for. Um, like burn mm. toast. It's um, not the AGEs. Anyway, it's escaping me. It'll, it'll, but if that's what she's talking about, I, I totally understand where she's coming from. But um, like the um, acrylamides, acrylamides, that's exactly okay. it. That's what I was thinking about. Acrylamide, <laughs> right? When you take exactly. typically like carbohydrates and you and burn them. Yep. Yep. The acrylamides. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you don't want to do it to like where the sugars are burnt. Yeah. I guess the over roasting. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, the, this, this, the caramelization of it. Yeah. Ah, yes, the caramelization. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, she put it in. Thank, thank you. See, you, you answered That's your right. own question there. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I would be careful of going too far, of course, and just cooking it yeah. um, to the point that it's, you know, enjoyable and not yeah. so crunchy. <laughs> so I have a question for you. It seems like um, these continuous glucose monitors are kind of 
popping up all over the place right now. I see them all over Instagram, commercials for them and stuff. This one. I, I, and, I, and, I, and I see you're wearing one too right now. Yes. Uh, is this something like, I personally am like, don't we have enough gadgets and things like tracking our steps and tracking our sleep and tracking our heart rate? It's like, don't we know how to do all these things? And doesn't our body know how to do them? And I understand it's a, it's, it can be, and I'm going to, I'm cocky and then I'm going to turn over to you. And I understand that it can be a very, potentially a very valuable tool for people. I would think, especially that are like type, type one diabetic, type two diabetic, pre-diabetic. Um, and I, I'm sure that if I was to do use one for a week, I'd be like, oh, isn't that interesting? You know, my blood sugar got up to 160 when I ate that, uh, whatever. But so what are your thoughts on the continuous glucose monitor and what has been your experience? I love, I love CTMs. So let, let me just tell you in the, in the context of where they're helpful, right? So you have a type one diabetic makes their lives so much easier because these poor folks, they are poking fingers at every meal, yeah. every snack, at exercise, you know, they're looking like, I'm not feeling well. Am I going to pass out because my blood sugar? So this has absolutely been game changer for type one diabetics, right? These were, these folks require insulin for the rest of their lives. <clears throat> so there's that piece. And the CGMs provide that 24 seven data. So you can see what's happening um, in different times, you know, variabilities, what's going on in your sugars. So type ones, and then you have your insulin dependent type two diabetics. These are the folks that I would hope would, um, you know, be able to eat a whole food based diet and, you know, transition off of insulin or oral medications that would need to be very mindful of blood sugar fluctuations. Um, but um, that's also very helpful when you're detriving, uh, titrating down medications, right? So I know like I'm seeing consistently mm -hmm. blood sugars hitting under 150 every morning. I'm like, hey, we need to start pulling back even more on the insulin. Um, the other things that are happening is like there's uh, type one and a half diabetics, right? So these are people who develop like an autoimmune type diabetes later in life. Many times I will, where I've seen these patients is they're eating a whole food plant-based diet, they're exercise, they're thin, they're doing everything appropriately, but their A1Cs are still elevated and they just don't understand what's going on. And that's where we put a CGM on them. We're saying, oh, wow, this is what's going on. You eat even just what other people eat and their blood sugars maybe hit 150, theirs are going to 250. And then it comes back down because they're insulin, so, but they're not making quite enough insulin. So these are individuals where we start learning how to dose with meals and you know, just need a little bit of insulin. So again, it depends on the person. Uh, do we check other te other tests like C peptide or insulin antibodies? So those are really very helpful. Then it was for the pre diabetics. What's been really good about this is that it really shows that moderation kills. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh. so, you know, it's a great behavior change uh, tool. So when someone thought, oh, I can just have the vegan white rolls or, oh, I can have this, you know, that little bit of processed food or oh, I can go out or I can do my alcohol or da, 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 da. And what you'll see is these amazing trends. Right. So I connect to someone's CGM. I give them a code and they connect their app to me. And then when we meet and we discuss it we actually can talk about the patterns and, you know, they can keep notes in there. What are they eating? What's happening? Um, and it's been really interesting to see their behavior change because when they scan their blood sugar, they're just like, yeah. Oh, it's an objective data. It's not me telling you not to eat this. Your body saying, this is what I do when you eat these foods and the length of time, right? How long does it take? You know, we talk about insulin resistance and it's just really making people mindful of what's going on now for those outside of prediabetes or <clears throat> i feel i feel like there's a there is a group of individuals for example if i measure insulin resistance that'll show up on a lab test before prediabetes does and you might these might be the people who have fasting blood sugars in the 90s their a1c's are like 5.4 to 5.6 somewhere in there this is a beautiful time too, kind of like the prediabetics to say hey here's what's going on let's talk about it and maybe encourage someone to lose the weight to get them down, you know, a little bit lower. So they understand they become more insulin sensitive and pay attention to the snacking because you ate lunch and now you're snacking an hour later, your blood sugars are staying elevated. And so this is just a point of discussion um, for myself. I've never been pre-diabetic. I'm insulin sensitive. 
I am just fascinated what's going on in a regular human body. So and, can I ask, can I, yeah. let me ask you this. Um, yeah. So what is, what have you seen your ranges fluctuate between? Yeah. yeah. So it's fascinating because you also learn about stress, sleep, exercise, all of that and what's happening. So um, my typical average is anywhere between like 65 to 130, 140. When I'm a good whole food plant based eater. <laughs> now, yep. When yep. I'm doing other so things. It's about like, a, so it's about a 60, 70, 70 point range. Yes, uh, on average. And what you'll, what's really interesting is when I get up, it goes up a little bit just because I'm getting ready for the day. When I shower, it'll go up. When you exercise, and what goes up, and then when it trends down. But what was interesting was I'm running, I have a group of, of folks that I, I work with and called the glucose mastermind, believe it or not, we do CGMs and we talk about these things. What was interesting is we're like, I'm going to experiment guys with, I love London fogs from, from, uh, don't, don't judge me from <laughs> Starbucks. And you know, what was fascinating is like, I'm going to do a little experiment. So what happens when um, I consume that? Wow. Blood sugar shoots up, right? There's sugar in it. But what if we pull out the vanilla pump and it's just the soy milk? barely moves like 110 so that's a great again you can still enjoy some things like when you're traveling yeah. and make some small tweaks the other thing is i went to cafe gratitude it's a vegan uh yeah. restaurant they're you know, like whole you know they're like organic non-gmo all these beautiful things i'm like you know what? i'm gonna try that cinnamon that's calling to me and just see what happens so i had that first and it's also like choice of foods how you compare them it was fascinating. So I ate that and then I ate uh, a wrap. It had lots of veggies. It had beans in it, some good stuff. So this that would have been fine. Blood sugar shot to 191. I almost panicked. <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, what in the world, Lori? But it came down really quickly too. Yeah. Um, like what's quickly? What's quickly? Like how quickly? Within probably within 15 to 20 minutes, it was under 140, you know, uh, so it, it came down pretty quickly. Well, what do you think? And, what do you think got it to 191? Was it the wrap or was it the Cinnabon? Oh, it was, it was the Cinnabon for okay. sure. Um, okay. And the other piece to this, I want to point out was stress um, because I watched a movie on world war II. Oh. I had not eaten for three hours. Okay. I love history. So I started reading on the articles, you know, I've, read so much i've been to all sorts of museums like it just fascinates me i went and, to you, and for people that don't know you have a military background i do i do yeah. and um so I, yes that that's 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 part of it and so anyway i again it's so we're talking three and a half four hours i go to bed i wake up in the middle of the night i'd had a dream about what i had watched which is not unusual I woke yeah. up the next morning and I looked at my data overnight. My blood sugars were typically always, you know, 70 or so overnight, trended up to 120 at mid or midnight. And then it just precipitously dropped after I woke up. I was like, this is stress. It was fascinating to me. So now I'm even more mindful of what am I doing to myself by watching stressful movies, reading stressful articles, listening to stuff I don't need to necessarily do. Right. And so I found it fascinating because with higher blood sugar comes elevated cortisol, all sorts of things. So anyway, that's for me has been an yeah. amazing experiment. Um, but, uh, but it also helps people who like to snack and eat too much and are struggling to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And anyway, it's been fascinating. But, but so. as, as somebody, let's say that isn't pre-diabetic type two diabetic, yeah. any of those things, would you say that most people, that are healthy have a range that's somewhere between let's just say 60 and 140, 150. And, and yeah. if it be, and if it be bops in that range, like yeah. if I that, think that's that fine. Seems, right. My point is like, you don't, the goal shouldn't be to keep it at 120, right. At all no. times and get obsessed no. with it like that. Cause I, I know yeah, I, think I, I read something about somebody that like they had some grapes and it shot up their, their, their glucose shot up 39 points and they were like, Oh my God, I can't have grapes anymore. And I'm no, like, no, 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 really? No. Come on now. Yeah. I mean, no, that's a normal response. And I think this is a great though discussion to have with people. It's like, this is a normal response to eating food that you require to be healthy. That's a normal, healthy response. Your body's obviously going to take that food, digest it. You should see your blood sugar rise and then it should come on back down. But where I do think it does help is, because I'm seeing sick people, right? Is 
These are individuals who are struggling to lose weight, stick to a healthy whole food plant-based diet. For me, it's a tool to utilize to help people. But yes, if someone is like myself, who's healthy, healthy weight, active, I don't need it other than I'm just, I just like to geek out on the science and see what happens in healthy people. Um, but there is a, you know, if you hit, if you look at the re- quote unquote um, suggested uh, ranges, it's between 70 and 180. So remember, these are for people who are typically diabetic, but the kidneys, for example, when your blood sugar hits above 180, and above, it will start, you start peeing out glucose. So Mm -hmm. if you want to even mark 180 is a healthy range, I think that's okay too. Um, Because it really depends on amount of muscle mass that you have, how active you are. So you may have a healthier, maybe a little bit higher range, you're still going to be okay. Um, But, uh, but it is a great tool. And I wouldn't dismiss it uh, for anyone who wants to know, but I, I think you need to be in context with the discussion with someone who understands the data and can go over that data with you. So you don't, I um, can't eat grapes. That's an unhealthy response to seeing that data. So you need to be able to, to learn and be reassured that you're okay. Well, yeah. And I think, I think where, where my hesitation and concern comes is yeah. with, with certain people that are advocating for people to really keep their their glucose in a very very tight range and because of that wow you really you can't do fruit and if you do fruit you have to do it with two handfuls of almonds to offset no. that you know that 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 sugar load and it's like no this is this is getting too yeah. too could too too ridiculous too yeah yeah no i agree i've actually had a few patients who were very healthy plant based eaters um, had a CGM from different companies and come in and speak to me. It's like, how do I get my blood sugar even lower? I'm like, I'm looking at their data because they, yeah. they showed me and I was like, you're fine. <laughs> like, and just to reassure them and kind of pull them out of this unhealthy obsession that your blood sugar has to stay the lowest possible at all times. Um, but yeah, so I think that's, that's, again, that's a discussion to have and people are going to hear things. And if they need you know, if someone wants to go through this um, understanding of why that I use it as a tool like to help people make better decisions. So instead of the processed food, instead of having that snack or whatever of, you know, candy bars, I mean, try to get an apple or a banana or something. So it, that learning for me is where I'm making healthier choices, not removing the healthy foods because my blood sugar bumped a little bit. It makes, yeah, that's, I agree with you a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like, okay, when I get up, when I walk up stairs and do, do right. certain things, what happens? My heart rate goes up. Right. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's not the same thing, but these are things that, that, that happen. But and it is the same it, thing. Okay. Okay, right? okay. I think it is because people think, oh, you know, lower heart rate's always better. It's like, no, actually there's a function for that, right? So like when you get up in the morning, your blood sugars will naturally trend up. People were freaking out about this. That's like my blood sugar is over a hundred. I'm like, let's look at the data and yeah. see what's exactly going on. So yeah, it went up because the cortisol is going up and it's getting your body ready for the day. Guess what? You need blood sugar and those big old muscles and to stand yeah. up and for your brain, which uses 20% of your glucose every day, by the way. I mean, here's this three little pound organ using <laughs> a fifth of the glucose that's in your brain. So if you are restricting your carbs, your brain, you know, then you go to ketos. And I mean, that's a whole nother thing, ketones. And yeah. stuff. But the main thing here is to understand that there is a range of healthy, but we live in a world that's doesn't have just the healthy foods always available, but if it'll help us as a tool to make different choices and to rest assured your body's doing what it knows what to do. Your body knows what to do. If you feed it the right foods, it'll do what it needs to do. There's no need to manage it. Um, but it is really interesting. To learn. All right. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I need to wrap this up. I've got, okay. I've got another appointment in 10 minutes that I need to prepare for. But uh, Lori, if people are interested, uh, are you taking clients, patients? What's, yep, what's your status yep. with that right now? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm licensed in all 50 states and D.C. You can find uh, me at drmarbus.com. Yeah, I'm happy to see anyone. Fantastic. And I'm sorry, you know, people like Justin and, and, and Jan, I didn't get to your questions, but we will have Dr. Lori uh, on uh, once every two or three months and uh, we'll be able to address all your great questions. This has been great. 
Lori, thank you so much yeah, uh, for, di for diving in with us and, uh, sure. and shooting the kale. <laughs> and I'll do some research on bananas and berries and vitamin D and showering. All I'll right. Well, and, 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 and the EPA and the DHA, that's always uh, out there lingering. That's an ongoing continual yeah. discussion in my brain. So yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Hey, give me a fist bump on the way out. Keep it playing strong. Hey, everybody have a plan.